Well, hello and welcome uh, to Back to Ask the Master Studio. I am excited um, to once again have the world famous uh, um, Brett Abbott. And Brett today is going to tell you the seven things um, in the contractor landscaping pool industry that you need to know about marketing. Now, um, Brett and I are socially distancing. Um, uh, we're, we're actually during this time of, of recording. Brett happens to be in San Antonio, Texas. Is, is that correct? No. My friend. Oh. Austin, Texas. Austin. There's nothing finer. Oh, man, Californians, you know, it's just all. Yeah, well, that's okay. <laughs> and I'm not like San Antonio. That's a great place to visit, but Austin is the place to live. I, I, was, I have... didn't say that. Don't tell your California <laughs> friends that. It's, it's overrated. Austin is not what you think it is. <laughs> Stay where you are. It's just it's fine. We're fine. We got plenty of Californians already. Thanks anyway. Well, Mr. Abbott, you are known for a book that you wrote some years ago, and um, I know you're still teaching this. Uh, we did just get news at the um, International Pool uh, and Spa Show in Las Vegas, which I know you've taught at many, many times, and we'll be teaching at again this year. It has gone virtual, and um, so look forward to seeing uh, the classes that you teach there at the International Pool and Spa Show, um, which will be in um, the cloud this year. In, in the Vegas cloud, today. that's right. It was a surprise, and you know, ironically, this is the first year I proactively bought my tickets months in advance, and uh, well, I blew it this time, so got a heck of a deal, though, but that's $110 <laughs> worth of air airfare that I'll never get back. Well, maybe you could sell it here today on the show. <laughs> you think someone wants to go to Vegas? <laughs> maybe so, yeah, maybe. Well, so, so, yeah. so what what prompted you to um, write a book? I mean, you're a marketing expert. You know, you do these uh, fantastic web overviews. You've looked at my website, frankly, and uh, I've got a lot of great ideas. Um, what what prompted you to write a book? Right. Well, so, you know, when I first decided to get into marketing specifically for this industry, I thought, okay, let's figure out what, you know, every industry is a little bit different. What does this industry need? So after about two years of working with a lot of different pool builders, I kind of narrowed it down. You know, there's like a hundred different things you can do. Uh, and I won't go into them, a hundred different things, ways you can promote your business. But when I looked at the swimming pool industry, based on the way people shop and make decisions about buying a pool, there's really just seven crucial things you need to know. If you know these seven things and you handle them correctly, then the rest of it really doesn't matter. It's all kind of noise. So, uh, and I don't, they're not just seven things. They're crucial. These are really, you really need to know these seven things uh, above all else. So there's not seven mildly interesting things, seven crucial marketing secrets that you must know if you want to be successful. Because I'll so tell the, you what, these, you get these seven right and then everything else just kind of falls into place. So these are seven critical things that each and every one of our listeners today really needs to evaluate their, their own, um, you know, what they're doing sure. and make it applicable. If they don't understand one of the aspects of it, they, they certainly need to get a call out to you and um, have you explain why, it, why they need to be doing it and, um, you know, how, how they can arrive at getting that done. Well, sure. To be clear, my I'm not here today to tell people they need to call me. I'm really trying to educate the public because uh, it's not that complicated. But, but uh, if they want, if they have questions, absolutely they can call me. But, um, well, fantastic! You got a, a PowerPoint to share with us today? Yes, sir. I do. I find it's much easier. A few graphic images just help to drive home the point. So, uh, if you uh, let's see, I guess I need to hit the share button, don't I? That would share be screen. fantastic. Boom. All right. Well, fantastic. Hey, you put the Ask the Masters logo up there, Brett. I appreciate that. That's a little bit of, uh, that's a little bit of uh, forethought. I like it. Well, yes. and, and a nod to the Masters. I'll tell you what, I'm really impressed with what you guys are doing. Uh, even your logo, a little creativity with the, you know, you kind of bring in the whole water theme there. So uh, I, I hope you don't mind. I took the liberty of going blue with it. Not that you need to change, but just it was easier to change your logo than to change all of my blue themed slides. I hope you don't mind. It, it didn't mind at all. Actually, you did it uh, justice. You just uh, embedded the white right on top of your border there. Fantastic job as always. Yep. Well, if you're ready, I'll jump in. I'll tell you, like I said before, seven crucial marketing secrets every pool builder should know. And I think in this podcast, I mean, this is an hour and a half session. So I thought maybe we'd cover the first three uh, uh, you can call an audible and then maybe we can pick up at the next time. Would that work for you? That would be fantastic. Let's do this as a two part series and uh, we'll take it up to about 45 minutes, typical of our podcast. And, uh, and then we're, we'll go into uh, the second part of it next. Sounds good. Like I said, I did write a book on this a while back. It is available on my website for purchase for a paltry sum of $9 95 cents. Get it while you can. <laughs> anyway, uh, let's talk about 
the first of these. The pool, it's about the pool buying process. And this is really fascinating as I uncovered it that, you know, there's a million things we can purchase. And a lot like groceries, that's kind of all the same. Gasoline, televisions, buying a swimming pool for a homeowner is, it's unique, it's different. Uh, it's from almost any other purchase, including cars, homes, uh, because it's, it's, first of all, it's a large purchase. So that means now we're talking homes, cars, and RVs. That's about it in the, terms of the, the dollars being spent. It's rare. Most people buy a lot more homes than they do swimming pools. Did you ever think about that? Oh, yeah, but, definitely. You know, same with automobiles, right? So you don't, so almost no one has any experience with it. It's, they've never done it before. It's totally custom, right? You're, you're buying something sight unseen. You can look at a photograph of somebody else's pool, but you can't see a photograph of your pool. Uh, you can see a design, but it's still, you know, you're, there's a lot of trust. And, uh, but because it's being complete custom and it's permanent, right? If they finish the pool and you go, oh, that's not what I wanted. Well, you're kind of screwed now, right? I mean, it's, it's, if, you, if you hate your pool, you kind of have to move. You can't just, I mean, you can tear it out, but now it's going to cost three times as much, right? So it's large, it's rare, it's custom, and it's permanent. So this is a really big deal. It's harder, I mean, if we think about it from the homeowner's perspective, it's potentially harder to buy a pool than it is to buy a house or a $300,000 RV. What if you bought a $300,000 RV and you hated it? Well, you could trade it in and get a different one or just, you know, get out of it altogether. But if you buy a pool and you don't like it, you gotta, you gotta sell your house, right? So don't get me wrong. The homeowners are excited and they're happy. They want to buy a pool, but, but from their perspective, it's very expensive. They don't know anything about it. They've never done it before. And if they make a mistake, they got to sell their house. So there's a little trepidation. So again, they're not going to be shaking while they're talking to you most likely, but we just need to recognize that behind the scenes, beyond what they're telling you in your face-to-face -face meeting, there's going to be a little bit, of, they're a little nervous. They've never done it before. There's going to be some reluctance and they've probably heard some horror stories where uh, they know that they probably shouldn't trust you. In fact, let me go off on a tangent here for a moment. Building a pool, I don't care if you're a doctor designing the pools, generally speaking, pool construction would fall into what we would call blue collar work right? It's construction, just like home construction. It's a blue collar job, which means uh, we lump, as people, we just kind of mentally lump all blue collar services together. The guy who mows your lawn, the, the, guy, the roofer, the moving company. And most people are not excited about introducing a moving company worker to their daughter to take them out on a date, right? We, we, we normally have some fear about blue collar workers because we're all humans, and uh, uh, well, we're dealing with a certain level of of, uh, of workers where problems can happen. Okay, so so there's that little bit of hidden distrust. No well, well, well Brett, Brett, real quick, let me um, go further down this rabbit hole because here in California, you know, you have to be a licensed contractor, and and we to some, you know, we need to own that in our industry because in California, certainly, we've had a number of builders who have taken a lot of money, even recently, dug 35, 40 holes in abandoned jobs. So um, there was a point in time in California where a pool contractor had to carry double the bond of any other. Um, point. In fact, actually, uh, there was a, a comment some time ago, I think, that said that you had actually had to be a, a known criminal to be a swimming pool contractor in California. So, you know, I, I think you, you go in, you know, just to recognize that consumers are aware of that and uh, you need to go in and, and build confidence and, and somewhat own what our industry has done and, and, you know, assure them that you're not one of those individuals. Right. It's sort of the uh, inverse of lawyers, right? 99% of the lawyers are giving the 1% of us good lawyers a bad name, right? But it's, it's the inverse. So you got 1% or less of the pool industry is giving the other 99% a bad name. But you're, the scenario of companies going out of business and leaving a bunch of, un it happens every year in just about every state, no matter whether it's a, an upturn or a downturn. So, so the point is there's, there's some concerns. Uh, another thing to consider here that makes this unique, and well, and it's partly driven by the fact that this is such a challenging decision with such long-term ramifications. I'll tell you, it's pretty rare for people to wake up one morning, get the bright idea that say, oh, hey, you know what? I just thought of something. Why don't we get a swimming pool? Hey, that's great. Grab your checkbook. 
we'll go visit three builders and we'll uh, sign a deal today. That happens almost never. How, would, how long would you say people think about it? In fact, you've got experience from this. Did you ever ask anyone how long they thought about it before they finally called you to have a meeting? Um, you know, I, I, I know it to be months and months, depending on who it is, and it's driven quite often. Um, as you know, opposites attract, uh, you and Naomi. Um, you know, so normally, normally, <laughs> nor, normally there's a creative individual in the relationship and there's one who pays the bills. And so there's a bit of this evolution that goes on throughout the buying process. And I think if you identify early on that in, in most cases, I can tell you in almost all cases that there was a creative individual driving the buying decision and someone who had to pay for it that was brought along. And that, that internal process can take months. And oh, yeah. quite often you're nurturing that. And if you identify it up early, I, I know that it, it, it helped me, but it is months. It's not right. days. It's not weeks. It's months. Right. And I'll go a step further that, uh, you know, there's many people think about it and dream about it for years, right? Because uh, they're nowhere near, not necessarily even searching on the internet because they're waiting for so well to the point that they could even afford it. Right. So yes, they think about it a very long time. So what that means is that for every person that's going to buy a pool today, there's probably another thousand out there that are thinking about that aren't even ready to talk to a pool builder, much less uh, have a meeting or write a check. So there's a huge pile of people out there that, uh, th that again, they don't normally get exposed to any real marketing until they get down to the final stretch. So we're going to talk about that later. But the point but, but they are doing research just real quick. Yes. So 80% of people in this day and age want to do their research on this thing called the internet using this tool called Google. And, um, and so that creative individual is doing a lot of that education to try and present, they become your salesman, right? And to the other partner that, that they want this pool. So that, that's why these digital assets, you know, this intellectual property is so critical and, uh, and, and doing it right will make sure that you certainly in, increase your uh, bottom line. Well, now, Randy, that's crucial marketing secret number four. Now, are you sure you haven't read my book? <laughs> I have read your book. So. <laughs> <laughs> it. All right. So, secret number one, buying a pool is a big deal, big, scary deal, whether they admit it or not. Secret number two, this is a universal marketing secret, not unique to the pool industry, but it applies to us just as much as anyone else. To the average homeowner, until you demonstrate otherwise, you look just like everybody else, right? Trying a moving company, buying gasoline, whatever you're doing, until you demonstrate otherwise, you look just like everyone else. So the analogy I like to use is the ugly fruit. I don't suppose you've ever heard of the ugly fruit out of Jamaica? Have you heard no, of this? No, I haven't. Okay. Very unique. It was a natural hybrid that was formed a uh, cross between a grapefruit and a tangerine or something. Uh, it was totally natural. They discovered one tree in Jamaica in the middle of the jungle. Some guy discovered it about 100 years ago. And, uh, and, he, and so all of them came from that one tree. They've, they've expanded it. And they've grown it. The interesting thing about the ugly fruit, as you can see from this image, it's pretty ugly. Right, which is why they thought, well, why fight it? Could, why fight it? It is ugly. Let's just admit it. But it's a great analogy of a, a marketing concept called inside reality versus outside perception. Every company has its own inside reality. How do they do things? Are they good? Are they bad? Are they cheap? Expensive? You know, are they professional? Are they crooks? There's the inside reality, but then there's the outside perception. We, like if we talk about lawyers, we all have a generally universal perception of lawyers as being crooks and or of moving companies being uh, shysters, but some of them have a great inside reality. The difficulty is uh, determining the inside reality. Uh, in fact, that's the job of marketing, is marketing has to communicate the inside reality to change the outside perception, because generally speaking, the outside perception, as I said, is well, you're just like everybody else. And of course, Randy, if everybody, if they, if they think you're just like everyone else, what will be their default decision-making? What, what, what's the most important thing? If everything else is, is the same. It's going to be price, you know, and, price. And, and you don't want to go there. You know, it's not you a great place to go. go. 
So with the ugly fruit, you know, it's, it's ugly on the outside, but when you cut it open, it's delicious, it's, uh, it's nutritious, it's very healthy. So uh, that's a classic uh, I guess, analogy that uh, you have to communicate to the world. By the way, I'd say that the people who uh, distribute ugly aren't doing a very good job because it's been on the market for 50 years and you've still never heard of it, right? You no. and a and a and 100 million other people have still never heard of it. So they need a better marketing guy. If you ask me. Well, I, I like the analogy though, because it's that sweet center that I, I think most of the people are wanting. And while they do want to deal with the ugliness of paying for it, they're living the dream of the sweet, uh, tender inside of, of the ugly fruit. And if you recognize that you need to dream with them more than you need to deal with the ugly outside, um, the inside becomes a lot more fun to deal with. And it's being that two-year-old that gets to create with them and dream with them and build that backyard lifestyle and experience. And uh, I like that analogy. That's a great corollary to that. There is, there is a sweet ending after all that ugly process you have to go through because it is kind of ugly. Another interesting concept from one of my favorite uh, marketing geniuses, Roy William, the Wizard of Ads. He says, it, talking about any business, any business owner, it's hard to read the label when you're inside the bottle. So a lot of business owners fall into the trap of, well, they're inside the bottle. So they don't, they don't know what their outside perception is. They don't realize what they look like to the rest of the world. So this is one case where it is smart to get someone to help you um, communicate to the world your inside reality. It can be a marketing person, it could be what well, it could be a friend, but someone needs to help tell you what you look like because you it, because you don't really know it. it. Again, you're inside the bottle, it's hard to see. Make sense? Absolutely. Another great little marketing secret, uh, if you want uh, this, this comes from Rich Harshaw. If you want to know why John Smith buys what John Smith buys, you've got to see the world through John Smith's eyes. That's another universal marketing truth that most of us <clears throat> are thinking from our perspective. Well, we, if you really want to persuade someone and get them interested in your product and get them to trust you, you got you to gotta see things from their perspective. You got to see things through their eyes. Uh, so uh, one of the secrets, so, because here we've fallen into the trap of using platitudes and whatnot. So a way to get around that is to treat your marketing story as if you are in a courtroom and uh, the judge says you have been accused of claiming that you are the best pool builder in town now what have you got to say for yourself well I care about people and we you know we use the best people and we get the job done right the first time you can say a bunch of platitudes but none of that is evidence so that would all be thrown out well that's that's hearsay it's meaningless so if you treat it like you're in a court of law, you have to provide evidence of uh, what makes you special. Well, uh, I'm, uh, well, let's see, I'm, uh, I'm a graduate of Genesis or uh, Water Shapes University, or I'm, uh, you know, I've built 15 vanishing edge pools. I've got, here's an example of an acrylic walled swimming pool that I've built. You know, I'm, uh, I've got 87 five-star reviews on Google and another 37 on Yelp, right? This is, these, these are facts and evidence that we use to prove that we are, um, that we're different than, than what, than what the, uh, well, let me, that's evidence and facts as opposed to platitudes. Platitudes are uh, the scourge of marketing, a trite or banal remark or statement, especially when it's expressed as though it were original or significant. My favorite one is when someone says, we say, well, why should I hire you? And they say, well, well, we'll get the job done right the first time. Well, I, I freaking hope so. Of course. Well, what do you mean you get it? Who who wouldn't get it done right the first time? I mean, is that really that's your A game? That's why I should hire you? Isn't everybody supposed to get it done right the first time? Driven to satisfy our customers. Well, and in this industry, you know what the most popular one is? We'll make your backyard dreams come true. Well, and don't get me wrong, it's true. But here's the problem: everybody says it. And it doesn't matter whether it's true or not. If everybody says it, then it becomes meaningless. It becomes a platitude. So Brett, way Brett, Brett, let me tell you a, a quickly a little uh, story that I had learned over uh, a long time of, of selling pools. I would go in with my portfolio. And my portfolio was bound, um, and I would print uh, color pictures of the pools that I had done. And, um, and 
what would happen is they would start to go through the portfolio instead of making these same, we're the best, we're the cheapest, right. you know, um, yeah. we're, we're trying to instill confidence in them and, and things haven't changed in zoom or in the way that we virtually do sales calls today. But I would, I would actually set that um, creative, uh, you know, portfolio on, on the desk. Now that gave the creative person something to look at while I was being interrogated by the money person. Right. And um, in the meantime, they would go, Oh, I really, I don't like this pool did flip through. I like this pool. I would grab that eight and a half by 11 and I would leave it on the countertop. Now that thing cost me all of 30 cents, right? I printed it on my own HP printer back in those days. And by the time they were done, you know, they, they hated 80% of the, of the portfolio, but 30% of them, I had polluted it for a cost of all of $3. Now, right. when I left again, that creative person was the individual that was going to pressure the money person into like, Hey, I just don't want to deal with it. It's more hire that guy. Okay. So that was one of the tools I utilized to instill. And if I could get the kids or the dog on board, it was game over, buddy. It was wow. game over. I went on the way out the door. I'd go, Hey, you hear, we're going to put a water cannon in your pool. <laughs> and, and oh, that's a dirty you, trick. <laughs> you got an eight-year-old coming after you know whoever the money person is saying, "Hey, that guy's going to put a water can, and we want that guy." Yeah. So, uh, you guys yeah, excited that. about getting a pool? Did I hear you say you also persuade? You went over the dog. I, I, I'm not sure uh, how you accomplished that. <laughs> yeah, um, I always had a dog treat in my pocket, and oh. you know, dogs know that. And so the dog comes up, he's smelling the dog treat because dogs are driven kind of by one thing, right? And right. Um, and so. I quite often had people look at me and go, yeah, that dog doesn't like anybody. I'm not sure why he likes you. <laughs> uh, nice. Smart man. All right. Well, the key concept I'm at after here is that we've got to make sure we're not talking in platitudes. We're sharing evidence. Photographs are probably the single best evidence. We talked about that on a, a, a previous podcast. That sure. Photographs tell the story, uh, second only to video. So if you're having trouble with the concept of platitudes, all you have to do is Take a look at what you say in your brochure or on your website or in a conversation with a homeowner. And if you can scratch out your name and write in the name of your most hated competitor and it still sounds believable, well, then that's probably a platitude. Okay? It should be, you should be saying something unique and specific that only you can say or, or at least that, that, that differentiates you from everyone else. One other uh, uh, great line, again, from Roy Williams, The Wizard of Az. He says, if you want to get a dog to do something, you have to talk to the dog in the language of the dog about what's important to the dog. All right, so that's, that's a marketing uh, analogy. Now, there is another trick. You could just put a dog treat in your pocket, and that would probably... Uh, <laughs> get the dog to do what you want. Well, I, I think that if you drill down in uh, Roy Williams, who's brilliant, um, you know, you to understand what the dog wants, you've got to listen. And, right. and that's the largest, I think, issue that, that salesmen or anybody else come in is they don't listen first. They don't, they don't observe. They don't look at the artwork in the house. They don't start to understand. There's a lot of clues that are given and it's not about you. You want the golden secret to life? It's not about you. You've got to listen and then you can start to speak the language of the dog. Yep. You remember the old cliche, right? Two ears, one mouth. Use your ears twice as much as your mouth. Absolutely. Right. So anyway, the key point here is that we've got to figure out how to differentiate you from your competition. If you've got a portfolio of beautiful photos, that you're 80% of the way there. But uh, that's the story that's got to be told. If we're talking websites, I encourage pool builders to put as much evidence and facts on the website as possible. Now, let me clarify something. Don't put it on the homepage. You know, now let me, let, me, let me get off on another tangent here. If you're a service company, well, that's a pretty fast, easy decision. You know, I'm trying to do I, should I hire this service company? Well, there, the evidence I need to see if I'm thinking about hiring a service company is, well, what does the rest of the world say? Do they trust you? Yeah, if you've got a bunch of five star reviews, then uh, I'm kind of 80% sold. So, so maybe on a service company or if you're a plumber or something like that, well, that's a quick, easy decision. Show me some fast facts that I can trust you. For a pool builder, it's not a quick decision. So on the homepage, we want to make it clean and streamlined to help them get to where they want to be on their, uh, in their search for information. So 
if they decide after looking at your photos that they want to learn more about you, that's a good sign, by the way. They looked at the photos and said, that's not bad. Let me find out a little bit more about this company. If they go to your About Us page, you want to be sure to share plenty of information with them. So uh, just some examples. A photograph of yourself or the team, if it's a husband-wife team, let's show that because most people are afraid to show photos of themselves. It, it makes you instantly more personable if I can see what you look like, all right? It's just, there's a certain trust there. You'll notice on this example I'm showing here, Better Business Bureau, A-plus rating, member of APSB, top 50 builder. There's a video to meet the owner. There's a section, 10 reasons people love us, that kind of thing. These are, this is all evidence and uh, like spectacular designs. That sounds like a platitude, but you notice it's a hyperlink. So if you click the link, then you're going to see a bunch of spectacular designs. So they say, oh, okay, well, that's true. You're not lying to me. These really are spectacular. So that's, uh, that's the approach. That's how we... Uh, Brilliant. Uh, you know, Brett, real, real quick. I mean, you've got the owner up in the hot spot, what we call the hot spot of the uh, website, the upper, looking straight into the camera. And people want that trust. Now, what? Yeah, it was the first place I went. I didn't read any, you know, I, I, I like to, I'm visual, so I don't, I didn't read any of it. But, right. um, you know, he's looking at you. So you say, okay, is this the type of guy that I'm going to allow inside the house and meet my wife and children? Um, and then down below, above the fold, we call it, you've got the video so you can hear the voice. So now they can already see, know, like, and trust this individual. Within that 80% time that they're doing the research, the About Us page is the second most viewed page typically on a website, at least from the data I've seen. So uh, yeah, this is this is a place where they go to see, okay, hey, do I want to let this individual in into Again, in virtual sales that we see so much today, it's why the Zoom meeting and turning your camera on, having the ability to do that is so powerful. Right. Now, this guy, John Versfeld, a lot, lot like Rick Chafee, where some guys are just so good looking that the husband may say, no, you know, I'm not sure I need that competition coming over to my house, you know. <laughs> he may be... <laughs> But then, of course, uh, he, but he may sell a lot of pools to wives, right? So we have to be a little careful about oh, that. Oh, boy. I, I guess you've met Rick Chafee. <laughs> uh, how to get the third, we'll kind of wrap up with this one, if that makes sense. The uh, How to get the best leads of all. Because this is the interesting one for a marketing guy to talk about. Because if you can nail number three, you don't need a marketing guy. You don't need a website. You don't need anything because this, this is the dream come true. In the ideal world, you are so popular, you get, you get the best leads of all that you don't need to do any advertising or any of that. And I'm, I'm cool with that. that. To me, that's the ultimate success. So obviously, the best leads of all are referrals, right? Because they tend to pay more than the price shopper, right? They tend to fight you less because they have higher confidence. Their friend has told them, Oh man, these guys are awesome. You got to use them. Okay, well then I'm not going to be so uh, nitpicky about it because my friend, I trust my friend, so I, I'm good. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to trust the friend and not get in a fight with this guy. Third, they tend to cost less from a marketing standpoint because you don't have to spend a hundred thousand dollars on advertising to get a referral. They tend to come in for free, so uh, obviously that's a benefit. And then ultimately they're more likely to buy. Your closing ratio with a referral should be significantly better than uh, a lead that just comes in through an internet, through, uh, through your website, right? Because, because of the trust. And uh, the friend thing is, is an interesting dynamic because, you know, quite often, even though they're very good friends, they're also in a little bit of competition. So one gets, you know, a piece of jewelry, the other gets a piece of jewelry. So now the, end, the referring individual has this absolutely gorgeous backyard. So now once you get a move in, you know, little triggers to say are, hey, yeah, you know, I've learned a lot since that job and I've got some really cool ideas that's going to make your project Oh man, it's just going to be fantastic! And all of a sudden, they're thinking, "Yeah, I'm hiring this one because I'm going to trump trump my friend." And make I, sure like that. It. I never thought of that. That's a great <laughs> trick, Randy. Uh, well, and I, I also want to point out that referrals are certainly easier and more fun. In fact, let me, mathematically speaking, if my closing ratio is one in three for referrals and one in five for non-referrals, then and I got two sales guys. One guy only works referrals, and the other guy only works. Um, uh, non-referrals, <clears throat> then the person who's doing the referrals is going to make more money and work less hours. 
because he can do, he doesn't have to do as many drawings. He doesn't have to do as many sales calls. So it's a, it's a, it's, a, it's easier and more fun. So that, that's, you definitely, I mean, and don't get me wrong. I mean, we all want world peace and we all want more referrals. So, uh, you know, maybe I'm preaching to the choir here, but I want to talk about how we, to nurture, uh, how to nurture more referrals without the two tried and true methods. The tried and true methods are you can beg, please, 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 would you give me the names of five of your friends so I can try and sell them a pool too? You know, my baby needs new shoes and this Beamer, I got a payment I got to make on this Beamer. Please give me the names of your friends. Or you can bribe them and uh, say, look, if you... If you give me the name of some friends uh, and they buy a pool from me, I'll give you $500, okay? And so uh, do you think these work? I say yes. These methods work, but they're a little smarmy. You know, they're a little, uh, uh, i tell you, I'm, I remember years ago, heck, I think I was 18 when I bought my first insurance policy, life insurance, uh, off at college. And, uh, and when it was all over, he said, okay, listen, can you give me the names of five of your friends so that I can talk to them about life insurance? And I, and I, I immediately, I was like, oh, I feel dirty. I don't want to do this to my friends. You know, it's like, well, I live on referrals. Well, guess what? That's not my problem, right? Yeah, fine. If I like you, I will refer you. But, if, but I guarantee you, if you're going to beg me or try to bribe me for referrals, you're not going to get referrals from me. It's the wrong approach. Why? In this industry, why not beg? Because if they knew someone, they would tell you. So this is probably, uh, this is where I butt heads with a lot of sales trainers. Sales trainers say, well, when should you ask for referrals? Always, always, always. Always be closing, always ask for referrals, or at least ask for them at the end. The problem I have is that, you know what? If someone was going to refer you, you wouldn't have to beg them. They would do it anyway. Because if you think about the last time you referred someone, uh, I don't know about you, but for me, I refer someone because I'm trying to help my friend, not my friend, the business owner, but my friend, my friend that I grew up with, the, the best man of my wedding. He needs to know, uh, he needs a good Mercedes mechanic, mechanic. So I said, you know what, you need to use this guy. I'm not doing it to help the mechanic. I'm doing it to help my friend. That's why people give referrals almost universally. We're not doing it to help the business. We're doing it to help the friend and the business owner is trying to make it all about himself. Is it no, if they knew someone, uh, they would tell you anyway. Uh, in fact, more, they would tell their friend. They're gonna refer you any, you don't have to beg them. And this is even more important in my opinion, especially in this industry, and especially in the echelon, Randy, where you used to work when you were building pools, that, that high-end, rich people. For example, if someone's got a million dollar home and you just put in a $300,000 swimming pool, do you really think $500 is going to motivate the housewife to try to persuade her friend something? She doesn't need your $500. It's an insult. And it erodes the trust in the friendship. You say, oh, we're not friends. You're just using me for money. So, okay. That, 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 uh, and they've got a life. They don't need to be spending time trying to help you get business. Same thing with bribing. Same reason. They've got a life. They've got better things to do than try and get you business. Who do you refer? You tend to refer people, as I said before, people that, uh, that you trust. And, and you do it because, not because someone bribed you, but because you want to help your friend. So let me five quick ways to nurture more referrals. Number one, just make sure they love you. Now, this is a challenge, but you know what? This is kind of like, you have to do this anyway now because of all the online reviews, right? All the five-star reviews. If you don't go out of your way to make sure they love you, well, then it's going to show up as a one-star review. Even if they haven't hired you, I find that very annoying. But the truth is, you really, nowadays, you need to go out of your way. Uh, nope. I'm not saying you need to lose money or a discount or anything, but you need to take extra time to nurture the relationship to make sure that not just that they're mildly happy, but go out of your way, try to make sure they love you. That'll give you a huge advantage because that, that's how you develop raving fans. Focus on their experience. I'll tell you one secret that I've seen over and over again that would help so many builders. If they would put a person in their office in charge of reaching out to the homeowner in construction every week just to say, hey, Bill, it's me, Susie, over here at ABC Pools. I'm just checking in. Uh, I just want to let you know there's not going to be anyone at your house this week because we're still waiting for the concrete to cure. 
but uh, but we're scared. Looks right right now. Looks like a week from Thursday we're going to be headed out there again. So again, no action required. I just wanted to give you a heads up. Hope all is well. Goodbye. Whether you leave a message or whatever, just because the complaints I heard over and over again were all the same. It was always, um, well, we never knew what was going on. Nobody communicated with us. That's not a very expensive thing to do. So focus on their experience, and uh, that'll make a big difference. Stay in touch after it's over. So, for example, uh, well, why? Because when you stay in touch after it's all over, that's how you maintain top of mind awareness. So that someone says you recommend a pool builder, but, you know, because after five years later, you may start to fade from memory. But if you stayed in touch, you know, maybe every once a year you send them a little card or a thank you or something, then they tend to remember you. If you right after the sale is a good time, maybe 30 days after it started up, when the pool is ple completed, birthdays, anniversaries, Christmas beginning or end of the season, anniversary of purchase. You don't have to do all these. You don't have to do any of these. But any of these is a good excuse to reach out and just kind of just touch them. I mean, I don't know about you. My, my uh, new insurance person, not the one that I that begged for referrals, but the one I've loved for 30 years now, she sends me a birthday card every year. And, you know, I know that it's a, it's a ritual. She probably sends out a thousand of them and maybe she doesn't all of it, but I don't care. It's still a nice touch. You know, I, uh, it reinforces why I like her, right? It's not like, oh, I like her because she sent me a card, but it just reminds me, you know what? She really is a nice person. And then I throw the card away, but she's maintained top of mind awareness. I don't know. Did you ever try any of that kind of thing when you were uh, building pools? I, I did. And um, I, uh, you know, we used a lot of social media um, to do the same thing in this day and age. So LinkedIn and following through and not naming the client per se, but, but use, utilizing it. So, um, you know, absolutely. Communication is everything. One other great secret. You've heard of the law of reciprocity, which says, uh, if I do something nice for you, that's unexpected, well, then you will feel compelled to return the favor somehow. It's kind of a universal thing. In fact, I've studied this in some depth, well, by reading other experts who really studied it, and they found this is pretty much universal across all human beings on the planet, that uh, any language, any country, any tribes, uh, when, you, uh, when you give something, there's an expectation to do something in return. So if we go out of our way and do something special and unexpected for the homeowner, it doesn't matter how little it is because they've already given us $200,000 to build their backyard. But if we do something above and beyond that was unexpected, then they will tend to feel obligated. So uh, here's my strategy. I've, I've covered this a number of times and I'll tell you, so many people nod their head and go, yeah, that makes sense. And they never do it. I have one of my clients, it took me two years of cajoling. Then he finally started doing it. And when he did, he's like, he said, this is awesome, man. They loved us. They gave us referrals. It worked great. They just, uh, it was just, it's an extra thing you have to do. It took a while. I call it the thank you meeting. The, and it's not that complicated. You're building a pool. What I say is when that pool is finished and it's filling with water, I mean, the day that it's filling with water, you call them up and you say, hey, I understand the pool's done. It's filling with water. Is that right? Yeah, it is. How do they feel at that moment on that day that their pool is filling up with water? Well, you know what? I think you nailed it best. You just went from ugly to you're just about to taste the sweet center. All right. And they're, they're so excited. They've been dreaming about this moment for months, if not years. And who made it happen? Well, the guy with the money and you. Right. So uh, the, the guy with the money already, or the gal with the money, they're already getting the credit from their standpoint. But you're part of the equation, too. So that's when you call them. If it was me, I'd say, hey, Susie, it's me, Brett. Uh, just checking in. I understand they're filling with water. Yes. All right. Good. Well, listen, uh, I've got some stuff I need to uh, drop off uh, for you. Are you guys going to be home around six? You know what? We uh, I'll be feeding the kids at six. Can you make it six thirty? Oh, yeah, sure. Six thirty is great. See you then. Right. So then you. Uh, it's just very informal. I mean, my expectation is that every pool builder or designer has this sort of relationship. A very, I know I would. I'd be very friendly, you know, like we're, we're friends. I mean, they spent $200,000 with me. I'm going to take very good care of them. So when I get there, I say, hey, do you mind if I have a look at the pool? And of course, 
they can't wait to show off the pool, right? Even though I already know what it looks like. Yeah, yeah, let's go. And I said, well, what do you think? How's it looking? Oh my God, it's great. What about that waterfall? Did that turn out the way you like? Oh my God, yes, you were right. You said when you told me to move it so I could see it from the kitchen window, I can see it from the kitchen window. It's awesome. Oh yeah. So you're kind of sharing in this moment together of the sweet center of the fruit. Then this is something, this I think probably turns a lot of people off, but it's so simple. And uh, it's not a substitute for quality control, and it's not a substitute for online reviews. But if what I suggest is you create a super simple survey, three question survey that says, um, Question one, how'd you feel about our work? And make it super easy that, you know, love it, hate it, mediocre, whatever. Uh, 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 did anyone impress you in any way? So if there's something nice they want to say, it kind of encourages them to say that. Were you disappointed in any way? Do you know why I asked that question? Why? Well, because if they were disappointed and they don't tell me, who are they going to tell? 10 of their friends, right? Or, or social media or Yelp or somebody yeah. else. So this and is, that is a short, right. short way to stop any type right. of negative reviews because they're, they're likely to go, they have places to go with their negative reviews. Right. I've already taken it off their shoulders. When I read it, I go, oh my God, I can't believe it. I'm so glad you told me. I'm going to take this back to the owner. We're going to have a talk about this. And they're going to go, ah, good. Now it's not nagging at them anymore so i want them to vent and then of course there's a space for anything else so you can get more testimonials that way so what i do, here's what i suggest you you walk in you look at the pool and say listen you know what we're always trying to get better okay so if you've got if you got 60 seconds i just want you to fill out this super short survey all right here's a pen here's the paper hand it to them and say i gotta i left something in my truck i'll be right back Okay, and I'm deliberately doing all of this because if I hand them the pen and the paper and say, could you do it right now while I go to my truck? Because if you hand it to them and say, can you do this later? When will they do it? Never. Ever, right? So it's like, hey, do it right now. I'll be right back, okay? So uh, that's why yeah, literally hand them the pen and the paper and walk away. And then you, I, say, I left something out in my truck. Now, I happen to re recommend, recommend the, uh, the fat towels. I just think that they are overwhelmingly universally loved because they are so remarkable. They're so uh, unexpected. The, not the cheap ones, but the really thick, the ridiculously thick ones where you can only wash one at a time because they're so freaking huge, right? So because uh, it doesn't matter how many millions of dollars your house is. That's a really nice towel. I mean, it's a $50 towel minimum wholesale. It's like a $100 retail towel. And it's got your logo tastefully embroidered down in the bottom, not gaudy, just tasteful. But, and that thing's going to last for 20 years. That towel is going to last forever. And where is the towel going to be used? Out by the pool, right? So uh, I go out to the truck and I get two of these, right? And they're big. They look like sleeping bags, okay? They're, that's how big and heavy they are. So you got to put one under each arm. So you come back and say, did you finish the survey? And, oh, yeah, just finishing it. All right. Uh, hey, listen, I want you to have these. And uh, you hand them these two. They're like, what the hell are these? <laughs> they're huge, you know. And they open one up and it's, you know, they could, you could put a family of four could live under it, okay? These are, that's how nice these towels are. They're overwhelmed. They're like, oh my God, these are amazing. They've never seen such a thing before in most cases. So, um, so now, boom, reciprocity. We've hit them with something truly unexpected. And then, of course, that thing going to be there forever. So it's going to remind them over and over again for years to come. Whenever someone says, wow, where did you get this towel? Oh, Brett over at ABC Pools. He did it. You know, he brought, he gave us two of these when we finished the pool. So what a, what a great the idea, Brett. That's amazing. You know, we, we will take a bottle of wine, but that's a way better idea. I know a lot of people in Texas take a, a bottle of barbecue sauce or something. But <laughs> that's that. What a great idea. Yeah. Well, in fact, I'm glad you said that because it's very classy and elegant I've seen very nice fruit uh, baskets, wine baskets. Yeah, it could be a hundred dollar basket, but how long does that last? Not very long. One night. Yep. One night, a wine basket, it's gone, it's all gone. Or you can bring them some pool toys. How long do pool toys last? Last one season. About very a long. season, that's yep. right. <clears throat> but it's just, so I'm not saying don't do that, but I just think you get a lot more mileage out of that towel. And no, I don't work for the company. I don't get a commission. I'm just 
I think it's just universally a, a, a great choice. Uh, then this is kind of to really uh, seal the deal. I say, hey, listen, I'm going to get out of here so you guys can enjoy your pool. But before I go, do you mind, can I just get a photo of you guys next to your pool? You know, I'll put on my wall of fame back at the office, right? There's like, what, well, you like me enough? To, you want my photo? Yeah, yeah, give me a, yeah, then, because, wow, that guy really does like it. Now, maybe they're still holding the towel, right? You know, it doesn't matter. But, uh, and I tell people, people get hung up. Sometimes the designers say, I really need to get a great shot of this pool. No. It's not about the pool. It's about them being happy standing next to the pool. This is the one time where I don't need you to worry about making the pool look pretty. Uh, it, it's about them with their towel. Because if you've got 100 photographs of 100 people standing next to 100 swimming pools, beaming and holding that fat towel, when your next prospect sees that, what are they going to say? They're like, oh, my God, you obviously made a lot of people happy. That's sort of like the other way to, uh, to demonstrate five-star reviews. Wow. Show all these happy people. So then let's get out of their hair. Now, this is where some salespeople would say, now is the time to ask for referrals. Hey, buddy, you know anybody? Can you give me five names of people I can call? Well, then I just destroyed that relationship, right? So rather than beg for referrals, I say, um, I would say it this way. All right, I'm going to get out of your hair, but let me, you know what? Can I ask you one last question before I go? If someone were to ask you, what was it like working with us? What would you tell them? All right? And they'd say, oh, my God, you guys are great. These towels, oh, you love you guys. Oh, well, you know. Or, you know, and then you know you're going to get referrals, right? Because they, they love it. You didn't beg or anything. You know you got a great referral there. Yes. And I've already told three of my friends. Right? On the other hand, if they say, well, you know, we did have that issue here and that issue there. I think, all right, well, that was very valuable information because now you know you probably need to do some more things for this person to try to win them back up to a, a five-star level experience. So, and then you get out of their hair. That's what, uh, how I recommend you do it. I, I see we've taken nearly an hour, so I'm going to suggest. Well, well, you know, um, Brett, I think this is definitely a two-part series and we've got to get to the last seven um, secrets, you know, so we're going to, we're going to keep our audience waiting. Uh, we would like everybody out there in Ask the Masters um, to, uh, if, if you have any comments or you'd like to see anything uh, more, please get reach out to us right away and we will get it to the world famous uh, marketing expert in the pool industry, Mr. Brett Abbott. Um, and uh, we want to thank you again. Again, uh, make sure that you check uh, the button down below and uh, leave any comments that you can. Hit the thumbs up. We'd love to see that here at Ask the Masters. Brett, until the second part of this series, again, thanks for all you do. And uh, we're looking forward to finding out those final three secrets that everybody out there needs to know. Final four. We got, don't forget number four, that oh, internet thing. You're, oh, four. That, that thing called the internet. Don't shortchange our audience. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Beard. It's yeah. always a pleasure. I look he, forward to seeing you next time. Oh, he is Brett Abbott. Stay tuned because we will get the part two going.